Today's reading is from Luke 1. We're going to read verses 18 to 20 and verses 34 to 37. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. bow your heads with me. We'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you, for you are an awesome God. We thank you that Jesus Christ has shown us the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life, that we know where up yonder is, we know the place that Jesus is going, so that we shouldn't worry or fear or fret or anything else, but have faith. Not faith like Zachariah, but faith like Mary, not knowing how in the world this is going to take place, but knowing that your word is true and it will not fail, Lord. And that we, without a doubt, know that if we believe in Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven and we will spend eternity up yonder with you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this Moving On, because we've moved on from the Sermon on the Plain. And remember, Luke writes this orderly account so that we know for certain what we believe. So what do you believe? And the way you, you show that you believe something is by the way you live it, right? Have you been reading your devotions? Because I'm going to start with our devotions this week. If you don't have a devotional book, make sure you get one. There's still one here. I've got a copy or two over um, at the Parsonage. This week's devotions began with Scripture readings from 2 Kings chapter 5 about Naaman, a foreigner, who wanted to be healed. He found out that, uh, that there was someone who could heal him. The God of Israel was real. So he brought 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, a bunch of fine clothing so they could be cured. How many times do we do that? How many times do we think that we can bring things to God, whether they're our deeds or even our faith or whatever, and that he's going to respond? You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is like the thief on the cross that said, basically, I'm guilty, you're not. Remember me. That's what we're called to do, to recognize that we are a sinner. There is nothing that we can do to get ourselves to heaven, nothing we can do to merit God's favor, but instead he lavishly pours it out on all who believe. But sometimes we think we need to do this or that, and sometimes we wonder why when we do this or that God doesn't respond the way that we want him to. God poured out His mercy on the cross for each and every one, the greatest act of love that we could ever imagine for anyone who believes that they will not perish but have eternal life. If you understand that, how can you ever say, Why me, Lord? Why are you not answering my prayers this way? Why am I suffering? And how can you also not live your life in full heart wholehearted worship of the one who gave his life for you. Matthew was called, we've read that in, in the Gospel of Luke, and then of course Matthew writes his own Gospel. He was called to follow Jesus, and he left all the things of this world that gave him comfort, peace, whether they did or not, because you think you put your, your comfort and security and family and friends and money, and then you realize that they, they're meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And he wrote these words in his gospel account. 
It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Do you remember when we talked about that? Jesus is quoting the wor words of Hosea because the Pharisees are hypocritical in their religious thinking. And they want to give every detail to the law, but neglect mercy and grace. Jesus goes on to say, For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So the first thing is for you to realize how sinful you are. Whether it's one sin that you've committed in your life, you have sinned against the Most High God, and you deserve, because of the person, the deity that you have sinned against, you deserve a punishment which is beyond anything that we can imagine. You sinned against God Almighty. Again, Matthew records this words. Those were in Matthew chapter 9. But in Matthew chapter 12, uh, Matthew records Jesus' words again after he said he's the Lord of the Sabbath. And it says, But I tell you that something greater than the temple is here, than this structured religion. If only you had known the meaning of I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. I've shown you a little bit from when Luke talks about Matthew and seeing his gospel through Matthew's eyes and what he thought about when Jesus was giving this sermon on the plain and what he had signed up for and this crazy, outlandish, outrageous, whatever word you want to use, way of living that's countercultural, that you would turn your cheek to get your other one slapped, that you would lend without expecting to be returned, that you would be merciful as your heavenly Father was merciful, and you would do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Holy Spirit leads Luke into writing next about this great faith of a centurion. I want to put all that together so you see this, because it's not just haphazard how these things are written in, in Luke's account, and Luke wrote this orderly account so that you could see what you believe with certainty. So I ask you, are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you reading along and are you studying and are you looking in your devotions to see how things match up with what we're reading? Have you learned the meaning of I desire mercy instead of sacrifice? Be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful. Then what does that mean to you? Are you building your life on the solid, firm foundation of Jesus Christ? that when your life is over, you will withstand the gates of hell. It's just the kind of life that you're building. Then we see the faith of a centurion. So let's go over the devotions a little bit. At first one, there was an Israelite girl that had been captured and hauled off as a slave. And instead of being bitter, she pointed Naaman to the God of Israel. She could have been bitter and said, why me, Lord, everything else. But she said, you know what? You're suffering, and i got a God that can take care of this. That's loving your enemy, isn't it? The end of that devotion said, Are there wounds in your life that you have never allowed to, to surface? Deep sorrows that you have never given over to God? Today, ask the Lord to help you cast your burdens afresh on Him. Ask for His divine enabling to view your suffering through the prism of Christ's cross so that you may be overwhelmed by His amazing, amazing compassion, so that you can be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful, and in turn be a blessing to others. Because if you're holding on to your suffering and your pain, she would have never pointed Him to the God of Israel. She would have sat there and said, Oh, God, save me. Why am I in this place? Instead, she said, Maybe, just maybe, you have called me to this place to bring about salvation to someone else. Someone who's so prideful and everything that thinks they can buy healing from the God of Israel. The second devotion asks this question. What do you do when something displeases you? And it's okay to get mad. It's okay to get upset. But what's your next reaction the, the devotion pointed out to us? And they gave example, examples from Samuel and Nehemiah which teach us to turn to God, to repent, to seek God, to seek His plan, His will. And then after carefully doing that and seeking God's will, do it. Don't be afraid to take those steps. Don't be afraid to step out on the rough sea because you might just walk on water. 
Ironically, the third devotion took us to Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount, which parallels Luke's Sermon on the Plain, but it's a different time, a different topic. But again, if you've heard me preach, you know I preach about some of the same things from time to time. And we read the words from Matthew chapter 6, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. Will he not much more clothe you? I'm skipping. This is not in sequence, so you know. I'm reading different parts here. O oh, you of little faith. Why do we worry about the things of this world? I mean, some of them are so silly that we worry about. And I'm not talking about the little things, <laughs> what you're going to wear. I'm talking about the big things. The boy, I wish this wasn't this way. I wish my aunt would come to Christ. I wish my son would come back to, to God. I wish that this person was healed of their, their disease. Those things are big. There's nothing we can do to, to worry or fret over that. There's no control. We can worry and fret over what we wear. We go to our closet. Come on, guys. Why do you worry and fret about the little things, let alone the big things? Isn't God big enough to handle them all? O oh, ye of little faith. We read up to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, which happened to, say, to start this way. Do not judge, and you will not be judged, right? Can you, do you remember the words from Luke? What comes next? Do not condemn, and you won't be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give in such a good measure that you shake it down, pack it in, and give all this mercy to someone else because you realize how merciful God has been to you. And you make sure that you pack it all in there and you get it all in there so that person sees that you truly believe in God. That you truly do have a Savior who is your Lord and His name is Jesus. The fourth devotion. We read from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord when I bow before the God on high? Should I come to Him with burnt offerings? With your old calves, would the Lord be pleased with a thousands of rams and ten thousand uh, rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You think it's coincidence you read those, those scriptures this week, these devotions? I mean, it's exactly what God had planned for you to do. So I ask you, did you read them? It was the plan set out before you, and it'll go perfectly with our sermon today. The fourth devotion asked the question, is there anything we can look to as evidence for faith? Look at your own life. Examine it. This is where we're at now. We just had the sermon on the plane, and then we get an example of great faith right afterwards. The Holy Spirit led Luke to write this account next, and it wasn't an Israelite who Jesus said had great faith. It was a pagan, someone who definitely should not have had great faith, who should have put their power, their, their wealth, they should have relied on those things, but they said, no, there's no way that I can do this, and I have compassion for a slave. But I know I've heard of this guy named Jesus. The fourth devotion Close with a challenge. Make it your goal today to ask yourself, what would it look like here and now to do all for the glory of God who loves me and gave himself for me? What would that look like? The fifth devotion told us to have hope because it is offered and found in the character and promises of God himself. If you're in the midst of trouble and grief, know that God sees, knows, and is willing to save. Why would he send his one and only son to his, the very creation, knowing that, that they were going to ridicule him, torment him, and crucify him? And Jesus went joyfully for the, to the cross to save you and I. The sixth devotion was entitled, God can handle our doubts. And the opening question was, have you ever felt a little shaky in your faith? Increase my faith, Lord. I don't want to sin by not believing in the power that you've given to me. A power to live like Christ in this world by the Holy Spirit, sealed by the Holy Spirit, so that on the day of redemption I know that I have stood on a firm foundation and you've called me to live justly, to love mercy, to be merciful as my Heavenly Father is merciful. 
And the seventh devotion was entitled Fearless Faith. Boy, that leads right us to the to centurion, doesn't it? That's why I, when I read these devotions going along each week, I was like, wow. Do you believe? Do you have the faith of the centurion? Have your eyes been opened? Have you been saved by faith? Well, if you have, then you're called to live a fearless faith. There are no shallow examples in the disciples that, that took that oath other than uh, Judas, right? And he turned back for he had a love of money rather than a love of God. And he betrayed our Lord and Savior. And he died in his sins. So are you saved? And are you living a fearless faith? You are saved by faith, Scripture tells us, to walk in faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. After the Sermon on the Plain, the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write the story about a centurion. But first I'm going to review a little bit. Mark began by reading scriptures from Luke chapter 1. Because we saw two examples of faith, remember that? We saw Zachariah's faith that said he's in the temple, he's been drawn to get in there, which was a once in a lifetime thing and everything else. The people are outside praying for him and Gabriel comes to him and he says, how can I know this is true, Gabriel? That's not the kind of faith that we're called to have. And so many times we're caught up in the religious part of it and doing the things that we are and we can't see God for all the other things. And then Gabriel comes to a teenage pregnant or teenage girl and tells her she's going to be pregnant and she says, how? How am I going to conceive? Okay. You've not explained anything to me. You just told me God will do it. Let it be done. All the promises that are in Scripture, you should be thoroughly reading God's Word all the promises that are there for you that believe, that He lavishly poured out His love on you, enough to call you a child of His own, that you can cry out, Abba, Father. So why do you worry about what you're going to wear, let alone the bigger things? Why don't you just put them to prayer and faith and let God do it for you? Luke wrote this orderly account so that we would know what we believe. He recorded these miracles. And this is in the order they happen. Jesus walked through the crowd that tries to kill him. Right? He cast out a demon out of a man out of church. I put church in parentheses. He rebukes the fever of Peter's mother-in-law. He healed many various diseases and cast out many demons. He commanded fish to get into a net. <laughs> and that Peter realized... <laughs> Jesus was willing and touched the unclean leper, healing him. Four men had compassion. We see the example of compassion there. And carried a lame man to Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He forgave the man his sins and healed him. They had to tear the roof off. They had to take some extravagant faith and extravagant means to get him to Jesus. But they did it because they had compassion and they had faith. Jesus saw their faith and not only did the miracle but forgave the man his sins. Then we have the calling of Matthew. That's not a miracle, but I just want to point that in there so you understand that. And then the Lord of the Sabbath. We realize that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He heals a man with a withered hand despite the opposition of the religious. Jesus picks 11 more men to walk with Matthew. That's why I'm putting Luke's gospel through the eyes of Matthew. And then he teaches them how to live. This upside down version. But before that, many people came to Jesus. And power was flowing from him healing them all. Do you see who Jesus is through the eyes of Luke and through the eyes of Matthew? Do you understand his teaching of the Sermon on the Plain? Because so many times you read them and you understand them and say, yeah, I know I'm supposed to turn the other cheek, but I just can't in this case or whatever it is. 
Don't you know that at this point Matthew's saying, how in the world am I going to live like Jesus has said? And then Jesus gives him an example of a Roman centurion who has great faith. Matthew's got to be sitting here thinking, can I be this way? Or am I going to be one that just cries out, Lord, Lord, and doesn't do what he says? What about you, dear Christian? Do you cry out, Lord, Lord, or do you do what he says? And are you building on a firm foundation? The next words written in Scripture are, when Jesus had finished, this is Luke chapter 7, verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There's a centurion, there a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servants. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell, you that, I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, or he marveled at this. And he turned to the crowd following him, and he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel, even in Peter, even in Matthew at this point. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. This is the example that the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write and Jesus said this man's faith marveled him, amazed him. It amazed God the faith that this man had. It was ludicrous faith. From our standpoint, don't get me wrong in that. Because this man did not know Jehovah. He had only heard of Jesus. He hadn't heard of this kind of miracle before. Not a miracle outside of Jesus' presence. Just say the word from whatever location you're at. There hadn't been a miracle stop someone dying. There had been a healing. But this man was dying. He was in his last breath. And this man realized who Jesus was and said, nothing's impossible for you. And he also realized, I am unworthy. And he also had compassion for someone he shouldn't have had compassion for, a slave. And he also was someone who should have been stuck on himself and his pride and his power and put his faith in those things. Do you see all these things? To the point that it marveled Jesus. You know, the only other thing in Scripture that marveled Jesus was he marveled at their disbelief. That's the two times Jesus was marveled. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. You're either gathering or you're scattering. You're either living a life of faith or you're not living a life of faith. You're worrying about these things when you should only worry about the one who has authority to throw your soul into hell. Has he saved you? Then live as his child. A child empowered by the same Holy Spirit that hovered over the waters and created the same Holy Spirit that was there walking with Jesus and raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of each of you. The temple of God, you are the temple of God. And the veil has been torn. You can see clearly. And you have access to the Father in heaven as His dearly beloved child where you can cry out, Daddy, I need this. Do you have the faith though? James tells us that faith without works is dead and that if we have, don't have faith uh, if we have faith but don't truly believe we're like a wave tossed around in the sea what is the faith that you have have you ever thought about scripture when you read it that way that right after the sermon on the plane all these things we concentrate on that and say how in the world can I live this way that there was an example of someone who should have not had faith whatsoever that had outlandish, outrageous faith. And Jesus marveled at him and said, 
There's no one else in the church that I've seen this kind of faith out of. Churches in parentheses again, comparing to Israel. The centurion was a foreigner in the land. He was the fact that they knew that they were conquered and they expected a Messiah that would deliver them from this foreign land, from Rome, this empire. He was powerful. He commanded many soldiers. He did the will of Rome, not the will of God. However, this was a good man. He took his own personal money and built a synagogue. He had slaves, yes, but he had compassion for them. He had a good heart. But good not going to get you to heaven, is it? Because a good heart realizes they're a sinner also and humbles themselves before God and says, you know, I can't do these things. Oh, and this is pointing to, to Jesus because that's where Luke is writing to is, is the passion of Christ. And he ends his gospel with the ascension of God into heaven telling us that we're going to have to live here on this earth until he returns, so we need to live like him until that day. The people, the elders of the town, whether they were elders in the form of government or elders in the form of age or elders as far as, far as religion, we don't know, it just says they're elders, but they told Jesus that this man deserves to have you do this because we get so caught up into that so many times. That is a good man, so he deserves this. He do, and he doesn't deserve that. Why is this happening to him? Good things happen, bad things happen. And they happen to all people, period. The thing that's different in you is how you deal with it. And yes, you might cry out, Lord, Lord, why is this happening in my life? But then do you put your faith in God that he'll take care of it? Or do you sit there and brood about it or try to take it into your own hands? without prayerfully seeing. Oh yeah, there's the, there's the acting upon faith, but if you prayerfully decided that this is the plan that God wants you to take, or have you just gone off and tried to do it in your own terms? These guys at least had man's wisdom, and they thought, hey, this is a good guy. Let's convince Jesus to do it because he's a good guy, and especially because he's given to the Lord in building the synagogue. This guy deserves for you, Jesus, to perform a miracle. If you go about it that way, don't ever expect God to answer your prayers. It's not a vending machine we put our quarters in and choose which soda we want to drink. He provides food for us. He provides rain. He provides sunshine to the wicked and to the good because of who He is. And He lavishly poured out His love for you on the cross through Jesus Christ that you received and accepted, if you did, by faith. And you're called to live by faith. Let's look at the miracle that the centurion wanted Jesus to do. To have mercy, right? He learned the, the meaning of that. To have mercy. And what did that look like? It would be to save his slave from death. Remind you again, slaves were property. And this guy was a Roman soldier that shouldn't care about anybody whatsoever. But he was highly valued. Let me add this in in parentheses again, as a human being. Not for what he could give his master, because his master realized he was a person made in God's image that could only come from God Almighty again, that you have that feeling about someone else. Because we are so prejudiced. And we look down on people so much. Oh, judge and not be judged, but we do it all the time. And that leads us to condemnation. But condemn and not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give. That's what this Roman centurion, he didn't hear those, that message. He wasn't there that day that message was. But God was already writing it on his heart. He knew that he could do nothing in this predicament with all of his power, all of his strength to save this man. And this man would die again. But he wanted to keep him from dying now and knew Jesus could. Well, that's got to lead us to what about happens when our day does come and we hold our lives account to Jesus. Do we have the faith that it takes to be saved? Or will we hear those words 
coming out of our lips, Lord, Lord, we did mighty things, deeds in your name. And the words coming out of Jesus' lips, depart from me, I do not know you. Do you have saving faith? And are you living an audacious life of fearless faith? This man had the faith. He knew Jesus had the willingness, the authority, and the power not only to heal, but save this man from death at that moment. How huge is this? We haven't read anything like this in Luke's gospel yet, that Jesus has the power over death. We haven't read anything about Jesus performing a miracle remotely. Where did this man get this kind of faith? We read our Bibles, and I hope we read our Bibles more and more, and I hope we read our Bibles carefully, but we read our Bibles complacently so much. And let me explain that before you throw rocks at me. Because we don't take it in the eyes of how it was there. These huge crowds are following Jesus for what they can get out of it. They've gone to Capernaum and they come in and, and come there, and here is this example that this pagan lives out. And they're follow, you're following this story along, and these, these people come to him and says, Don't even bother coming back. Just say the word. Everybody's like, What? We've never seen Jesus do that. We've seen Jesus do some things. That's why I gave you the miracles. But we've never seen him see the word and over there this person was healed. Who can do that? And this man is dying. How, how do we know Jesus can save that? It's one thing to cure leprosy or a withered hand, but this man is dying. Oh yeah, re keep reading because in Luke chapter 8, we're going to see a girl raised from the dead, aren't we? Oh, well, we're going to see one in Luke 7, aren't we? Because Luke is leading us to that point. That this is God Almighty in the flesh. Are you listening to His words so that you can obey them? Are you astounded by what is going on? And are you astounded by this faith that marvels Jesus? This pagan should have demanded that Jesus come to him because he was worthy that Jesus do this. But he realizes he is not worthy. Just like I said about the thief on the cross. At the very last second of his life, he told the other criminal, shut your mouth. You know you're guilty. I'm guilty. Jesus is not. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. The centurion thought to himself, if I am a man that has this authority and power, we take this the part of that scripture where he says, go and come and do it. He says, I know I have this kind of authority and power. He said, but I know so much more that you have that authority and power over everything, the winds, the wave, the sea, all of creation, because you are the Lord of creation, not just the Lord of Sabbath. And you can simply say it, and it will be done. The Son of God Himself marveled at this fearless faith. I use fearless faith because that was our devotion from yesterday. Have you thought about this? What if that man was wrong about Jesus? He would have lost all of his power because he would have said, this man can do it and now he's not. Now you're, you don't have any power because you're, you put your, your faith in someone else that, that fell through. Wait a minute, I don't ever do that. I don't. When I don't think Jesus can do this and I want to take it into my own hands or I want to continue to cl complain and, and brood about it, Maybe I don't want to do that because I think I'm a fool or others will think I'm a fool if I believe and my faith is strong enough that it says to Jesus, I know you can move mountains. Move them for me. Doesn't Scripture say that? Instead, this guy took that leap of faith and Jesus marveled and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Wow. I call that auda audacious faith. After an audacious sermon on the plain. Right, You've got you to define audacious because so many times you think audacious is bad. You get that th thing. But here's the definition of audacious. To be bold, courageous, unconventional, like the guys that rip the roof off. 
That kind of faith is the kind of faith that marvels your Lord. And he wants you to have that kind of faith. And he sees you. And he wants to comfort you. So I've got to ask you, what things cause you to not have that kind of faith? If you believe that Jesus gave his life to save yours, why would you doubt his love for you? Why would you doubt his desire or his ability to move mountains in your life? O oh, ye of little faith. The centurion realized he could not do anything. He was unworthy. He therefore evaluated himself, evaluated the issue of death, and he put mustard-sized faith, seed faith into action, and it grew. Can you imagine after that what it grew into, that biggest of garden variety plants where birds could come and rest upon that kind of faith? I say to you again, faith is, dot, 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 you know the definition, complete, utter hope, secure hope in what you cannot see. And without faith, dot, 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 it is um, impossible to please God. And he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The problem is so many times we see Jesus just reading the text rather than seeing who Jesus really is. The mighty miracles that we're seeing here. We've read this over and over again. We didn't experience it for the first time. But you are experiencing it if you read the scripture through the lens of the, the, the author and the people that are there. So that you can properly see yourself in light of God's word. Who you are. I don't know about you, but as I read scripture and I study more and study more, and I know it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, it makes me realize more and more and more how much Jesus as a Savior deserves the title of Lord of my life. And that kind of faith, if I could only get more of that kind of faith, it would show more and more that I really believe that He is Lord. Well, we're not stopping there. The next words that we read in Luke's orderly account is soon afterwards. Jesus went to a town called Nain. His disciples went with him and accompanied, and accompanied by a large crowd. As he approached the town gate, he saw a dead man being carried out, the only son of his mother. <clears throat> and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Do not weep. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. Then Jesus gave him back to his mother. A sense of awe swept over all of them, and they glorified God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has visited his people, and the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding region. Again, the Holy Spirit is inspiring Luke to write these words. We have the Sermon on the Plain. We have this audacious display of a fearless faith from someone it shouldn't be and it marveled Jesus Christ. And the next words is, Jesus traveled along down the road and came to the town called Nain and he saw a dead boy, but when he saw the mother weeping and sorrowful, he had compassion on her. She didn't come to him. She didn't request him. She was just there in her misery and pain. And Jesus saw it reached out and did something about it. Is that what you do, O Christian? Without even someone asking you to bring comfort or healing, do you just see the misery that they're in and it breaks your heart and your soul and you do something about it? This is exactly the next words inspired by the Holy Spirit written by Luke. Soon afterwards, Jesus goes to the town of Nain. What's the town of Nain? It's a nowhere town. You ain't never heard of it besides this miracle, right? But do you know what its name means? The Uwalt? 
Name, do you know what the definition of name is? Pleasantness, loveliness, beautiful, a place of greener pastures. Isn't that what we expect? We just go down a little, the road a little further where death is creeping at our door here and Jesus does something about it. And we go down the road a little further to this town of greener pastures and we think everything's going to be fine. But you know what? Death comes to every one of us. You might fight your battle with cancer today or whatever it is, but tomorrow, whenever that happens, you're going to be put in the ground or meet Jesus face to face, however it is, and your life is going to be over. What have you done with your life? Because Jesus had looked at each of you personally and said, I laid down my life for you. Do you believe? And if you do, you know that you're a new creation. That you're saved by grace through faith, that you were created before time ever began. God knew all this and intended for you to be His masterpiece to do good works. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, very much paraphrasing. Jesus saved the slave from death, but soon afterwards death came to a place where we thought greener pastures were supposed to be. Who is this woman? We don't know, but we know this. She's a widow. That means she's lost her husband. We don't know how quick that was. It could have been right away. It could have been a while, whatever. And now she's losing her only son. She's alone in this world. Oh, how many times have I felt alone when I wasn't alone? She's alone. She has no one to care for her, and women at that time were no more than property themselves. Who's going to take care of her? Especially if people don't know mercy. Who's going to take care of this woman? Besides the lost, you're not supposed to... I mean, spouses, yeah, one of us has got to see the other one die. But you're not supposed to see children die first. And Scripture implies this is a young boy. We don't know his age or anything. But you're not supposed to lose children, but that's what happens in this world because we live in a sinful creation because we decided to rebel against God. But thank goodness that He lavishly pours out love on us. <clears throat> Death has come. The whole town sees. The whole town knows. He's carried out on a, a buyer, if I said it correctly, which is an open-type casket. It's more like a couch. And you don't touch the, the body, you don't touch the coffin or anything, you only touch the poles that are carrying it, and Jesus goes up and touches and defiles himself in this, but that's not even really important in this. And what's important is Jesus sees this woman in her pain. She doesn't ask for him, but he sees her and has compassion for her and does something. So, most, so many times you don't even realize the miracles that God has done in your life when you weren't even praying about it. And you know the biggest miracle of all, when you die, you will see the kingdom of heaven if you truly believe. Jesus saw her and he had compassion that moved him in his inner being to react upon it. What did he do? First, he told her not to weep. Well, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> Why am I not going to weep? Look at the circumstances in my life. But Jesus tells you, don't weep. Don't you know the final outcome? Shouldn't you have joy and peace as you walk through the troubles of this world? And don't they give you perseverance and strengthen your faith? I mean, all you've got to do is turn to those scriptures. So do you have that kind of faith? <laughs> but the first thing we do is say, really? You know, I lost my husband. You know, I lost my son. What reason do I have to live? And then secondly, Jesus went and did something about it. He told the young man, get up. Then what was the third thing he did? He gave the young boy back to his mother. Wow. If that's not love. All the things that 
I've asked you the question about before that kept you from faith or kept you in that state of hurting or pain. Jesus wants to get rid of it all. He did get rid of it all. Why do you hold on to it? God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. How does He not love you in whatever circumstance you're in and have compassion for you and wants to draw you into an eternal life of bliss? But you've got to walk through this world first and you've got to walk by faith. And the kind of faith that marvels Jesus is this fearless, audacious faith that says, through Christ I can do all things who gives me strength. A sense of awe swept over all of them, and they glorified God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has visited his people, and the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding region. God surely did, did, did visit his people that day. It was just like the miracle of Elijah, but he didn't have to lay over the body and pray to God. Jesus just touched, and he'd already proven remotely that he can do whatever. He is with us always. He will not forsake us. He has given us the comforter to be with us, an advocate to the Father. That when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit cries out for us with words we cannot understand. What kind of compassion and what kind of love is this to you? Now look at verse 13 again. Verse 13 says, When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Do not weep. I pointed out to you the story, but now let me take it back to Luke's eyes. Luke hasn't called Jesus Lord until this point. Others have called Jesus Lord. Jesus has called himself Lord of the Sabbath. But Jesus, Luke hasn't referred to Jesus as Lord personally. Did you catch that? You're going to see it in Scripture from, from here out. I don't know why those words are written that way, but this is where Luke tells us for sure this is who he calls Lord the one that has compassion enough for this woman and has compassion for me, that you know what? With my life, I'm going to call him Lord. I'm not going to call him Savior. I'm not going to call him friend. I'm, not, I'm going to call him Lord because he's Lord of all. And Luke gave up his money for being a physician and his time and traveled around with Paul and kept Paul alive <laughs> and the others that went with Paul. Luke knew that Jesus saw him personally and had compassion upon him and gave his life on Calvary to save him. What about you? Did you realize that? And do you call Jesus Lord and do what he says? What kind of faith do you have? Oh, it may look like you're a Jesus freak to others or have absurd faith to keep believing this. But do you keep on fervently praying and praying and praying for that grandchild or whoever it is, knowing that God is willing and compassionate enough to save them and answers prayer? We don't know how many times the effective prayer of a righteous grandmother saved a grandchild or a great-grandchild. And we may not ever know those answers exactly. But do you have faith to keep living a life that's an example and keep praying and keep doing or are there things that you're holding on to that you're suffering about and you're not giving to Jesus or you lack faith on are you just afraid to say to Jesus this is so outlandish so crazy but I need you to do it because his answer just might be sure I can do it I will do it we don't know his timing. We don't know his ways. But he honors that outlandish faith that comes to him and says, Lord, will you... Now, you've got to put whatever that is in there. I've got, got plenty of them in my, my heart, my mind. But what are you willing to humble yourself for today to reach out to Jesus no matter how outlandish and ask him to take care of it? And have the faith to know that he can.
Why in the world would God send His only Son to die for your sins and not be willing to answer your prayers? That's ludicrous, unbelieving faith that would marvel our Lord. I've got a song I'm going to play first. It's not on your thing. And I'm going to give you time to pray, whatever you want to do. This is right where we're at. You know the words of the Sermon on the Plain. You know the centurion's example.